modern understanding of the processes of continental rifting that lead to the formation of new oceanic lithosphere have been revolutionized in the last 20 years or so by seismic images such as this one here. This is for a so-called magma pore uh, continental margin, a rifted margin, and we're gonna have a go together at interpreting it. There are many ways in which you can interpret deep seismic profiles like this. Um, so the final geometry that I'll show at the end of this video is one of a number that can explain the structure, although many of the fundamentals are the same in many different interpretations. So let's look at the image first. Well, this seismic profile is depth converted, so the vertical scale is in kilometers, and the representation here is vertical and horizontal scales are equal. For me, I think this is fundamentally important when building uh, structural interpretations of sedimentary basins. Vertical exaggeration can really get in the way, and we don't have to worry about it here because our vertical and horizontal scales are equal. So let's start by taking a quick look at the line as a whole. And the first thing is, well, let's check what's happening with the water depth. So this is sea level here, and this is the seabed, obviously with the seismic imagery below the seabed. And we can see we go from shallow water here to deep water over here. So this is the continent side, and this is the ocean. That means that this area here presumably is continental crust, and over on this side, well, potentially this is oceanic crust. So somewhere in here we have the uh, continental margin. Well, I find it useful when doing these types of regional exercise to try and pick the base of the post-kinematic strata. We can see that the sedimentary layers in here, which have got this nice continuous reflector character over tens and tens of kilometers, well, that changes here. So there's a surface that separates the simple sedimentary successions from other geology below. So I'm just going to pick that and trace it out across the image and see what we get. So I'm just picking the base of this stratal package, which I can see coming down across this little trough, back across here, maybe sort of something like that, and up to the surface. Let's continue this way, and we can see it come down here. So above the line I'm drawing, the strata are more or less horizontal. And below that, there's much more complicated geology. In fact, it's very hard to image it. And I can just continue to pick it all the way across. So I find it useful just to gently colour in this post-kinematic succession. Let's just do that. So what can we see here? Well, what's really interesting is how this thickness of post-kinematic strata changes across the section. And it's at its thickest in this area here, between the undoubted continental crust and the possible oceanic crust out here. So that's an interesting point. It's almost like a moat on the edge of the continent. But what I'm gonna do now is try and use this um, stratal succession up here to constrain the ways in which we interpret what's going on at depth. And we'll start off um, on the ocean side over here. Right, well I just want to get an idea of the thickness of the oceanic crust that underlies these strata here. Uh, and to constrain it, I'm just going to get an idea of how much water and sediment overlies uh, the crust here. So I'm just going to measure these up. Well, there's a total thickness here of 10 kilometers of material, of which about four is water and about six is sediment. 
Well, that kind of suggests that we're dealing with normal kind of thicknesses of oceanic crust, not unduly thickened, that's for sure. Um, so normal thickness oceanic crust is about six or seven kilometers. So let's just take that thickness again, as we've measured it already. And this should be the thickness more or less of oceanic crust. Let's come down here and suggest that that is where the oceanic moho would be. And if we look at the seismic character in here, well, that pick that I've forecast its position for the moho coincides with this zone of reflectivity, or rather the end of the speckled uh, reflector character that presumably represents the lithospheric mantle. And this more transparent material on top would be the oceanic crust. So I'm gonna suggest that this is our oceanic uh, moho. So let's just draw that on. Now the temptation might be if we were to continue to push this uh, moho uh, trace further in this direction, to drop it down and try and capture this reflector character down here, which would suggest the oceanic crust thickens as we move in this direction. I don't think that's an appropriate interpretation though, because the overlying strata more or less retain thickness. If this was thick oceanic crust, then the, then the base of the uh, sedimentary pile should be slightly upstanding with respect to this area over here. Um, if we think about the isostatic consequences of changing crustal thickness. So I'm gonna continue picking my ocean crust moho to here. Now, as we reach this area, we can see that the base of the cover sediments, the top basement surface, is gradually getting deeper. And that suggests that the oceanic crust here is thinner than on this side here. So maybe the moho starts climbing in this position to about here, which at this stage is as far as I really want to pick it. While we're in this part of the section, let's just turn our attention to the post-kinematic strata. And we can see that the lowest part of the reflectors in here onlap the top basement pick that we put in originally, and as we come this way. So of course, that implies that this part of the ocean floor is older than this package in here, which is overlain by younger strata. And of course, that's what we expect uh, if seafloor spreading gradually increased the width of this uh, oceanic lithosphere with the spreading center being off the side of the section. So let's just capture that information and I'm just going to capture it by picking some reflectors in here that show that on lap style as we come across. And I've just sent some annotation here to um, make those points. Okay, let's turn our attention now to this area here, the continental side of our margin. So I can see that the um, bathymetry increases as we move in this direction. The distance between the sea level and the seabed is increasing. So too is the thickness of the uh, sedimentary strata in here as we go in this direction here, uh, culminating uh, in a high thickness in this position. Well, that suggests that the continental crust, which is supporting the water and the sediment, is thinning as we move from left to right. So I'm going to pick this to be my continental moho, which will define a wedge of continental crust that tapers out as the sediment thickness and bathymetry increase. Let's just draw that on. And I'm just gonna pick it at the base of this more reflective package here. And I'm gonna stop about there. You've noticed I've picked the mohos with distinct colors. Green for the uh, oceanic crust or the base of the oceanic crust, uh, pink for the base of the continental crust. And of course, these are very different uh, features. The 
base of the continental crust, well, presumably that's the age of the continental crust itself, which could be billions of years old. The oceanic crust, however, formed after the rifting of this continental crust. So this moho may only be a few tens of millions of years old. So these are very distinct geological features, even though they may represent the same geophysical, or the edge of the same geophysical layer, the mantle. So fundamental to understanding the problem of this profile is to understand how these mohos work and what happens in here. Well, before addressing that problem, I'm going to look at the structure in a bit more detail of the continental crust. Well, in order for this crust to thin and also to generate this hummocky top of basement surface, well, it's highly likely that the crust is faulted. Now, the image in here is of not sufficient quality to image the faults. So what follows is pretty speculative, but nevertheless, I think it'll take us in the right direction, or at least generate a consistent interpretation. Now, this is the post-rift, post-kinematic succession. It'd be really nice to try and identify the pre-rift, if it exists as a stratigraphic package, and maybe some sin-rift. Well, I think if you look in here, you can see some reflector character that is inclined down in this direction. So I'm going to suggest that the pre-rift packages in here are inclined down to the left. And I'm going to draw these in. So if that is a pre-rift package that's rotated like that, presumably that is a fault. So the edge of this basement contact here is a fault surface where that has moved down, implying that the pre-rift package would be up here on the edge of the image. So I'm going to take that motif of faults inclined like this and inclined pre-rift like this to interpret this hummocky shape and try and interpret where faults go as we come across. Let's have a go at that. So I've picked the right-hand sides of each trough to be the pre-rift succession and the these will be the faults coming down like this. So let's just draw the faults on. Something like that. And I'm just going to tidy it up by snapping the pre-rift to the fault surfaces. Let's just do that. That's been eroded. The fault block's been eroded here. Snap back, snap back. These snap back. Not quite sure in this. There may be um, some erosional features in here that have eroded things. Snap, snap, snap snap and then as we get down here the rotations presumably are such that the pre-rift is now really steep as we go to this side of the image. So overall in here we've got rotational normal fault blocks and no sin rift or virtually no imageable sin rift. Pre-rift, post-rift shown by the two shades of blue here. So this interpretation shows a consistent set of down to the ocean throwing normal faults with back rotated uh, pre-rift strata like this and it's these structures in here that I'm considering are responsible for thinning the continental crust. What's interesting though of course is that as I've interpreted it in here the dips on these normal faults and the rotations is more or less constant across the profile which would suggest that the stretching factor experienced by the upper crust is more or less consistent. But the crustal thickness changes uh, across here. So there's a conundrum here that we'll need to face at some stage. Okay, but what about here? Well, in this part of the profile, if I was to keep drawing the subcontinental moho a little bit further, it would reach here and be adjacent to the sediments. Well, I'm just going to do that. And I'll complete now to the some faults in here, but presumably these are really rotated coming down like this to have really thinned away the crust in this position. 
So in this position here, the crustal thickness is vanishingly small to non-existent. In this case here, there would have been mantle rocks exposed on the seabed so these sediments can be deposited upon the mantle. So we've exposed mantle during the rifting process. A really great example of hyperextension. So because we've got mantle rocks exposed on the seabed so that they can be overlain by sedimentary rocks, it means that there's no crystalline basement in here apart from the mantle itself. So the subcontinental moho and the oceanic moho, well, they never meet. There's a tract in the middle here where there's a mantle directly against the surface or the buried surface now. And we can see that that is consistent with the idea that this is the area of greatest subsidence recorded by the thickness of the post-kinematic strata. So this area here is the place where the, there's the thinnest or indeed non-existent uh, crust. We just have mantle rocks in here underlaying the basin. So how are we going to terminate this moho, the oceanic one? Well, it's all pretty diffuse in here, isn't it, in terms of what happens beneath the sedimentary rocks. But I reckon that this region in here marks the formation of the new oceanic crust. Bear in mind that this material in here is igneous. So these can be intrusive materials that are intruded into the mantle. And that mantle is originally subcontinental mantle. So originally we're saying there would have been continent on top of this that's been pulled away, exposing the mantle beneath. And during that process, we've got intrusion of uh, magma derived from partial melting of the upper mantle that ponds in here. And that process then triggers the start of proper seafloor spreading and the formation of quote unquote normal oceanic crust over here. So let's just draw that all in. So let's ask the question about how this mantle was exposed. And one possibility is that the continental crust, well, let's just have a piece of continental crust, was originally on top and it's been pulled away in this direction to expose it, which would make this a shear zone coming down like this. Pulling this continental package or continental crust away from its own mantle, exposing it on the seabed. Finally, I'm just going to add some annotation to this part here so I've captured what's going on. And finally, I just find it useful to draw little cartoons in the margins just to explain how I think the system works. So it's this low angle fault that has pulled the continental crust away from its original mantle, leaving that mantle lithosphere exposed to be buried by strata. Um, and the process then continues with intrusion and eventually seafloor spreading and the formation of new oceanic crust over here uh, on the right hand side of the image. So it's a really dramatic seismic profile. There are different ways you can interpret the details in this, but the overall structure of thin continental crust potentially even absent crust here. So we have mantle with sedimentary rocks de deposited on top and then the oceanic crust developed later to the side. Spectacular image.